I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Our guest today is Max Cleland, former Georgia Secretary of State and United States Senator from Georgia, who during his 32 years of public service has served in the legislative and executive branches of both the state and the federal government. Welcome, Senator Cleland. Well, thank you, Bob. It's an honor to be with you. Let's start with your early life. You grew up in Lithonia. I grew up in a little place called Lithonia, Georgia. But the first uh, four years of my life was spent uh, at the corner of, in an apartment complex, at the corner of Moreland and Euclid Avenue in a place called Little Five Points. It was called Little Five Points in those days. Uh, Inman Park, really. And uh, it's ironic that the Carter Center was placed about uh, less than a mile from where I spent the first four years of my life. So uh, I can remember uh, when I was about four, uh, there was something very sad. <clears throat> my father was off at World War II and stationed at Pearl Harbor after the attack. There was something very sad that happened. And uh, reflecting back, it was the death of President Roosevelt in the middle of April of 1945. And then there was a tremendous rejoicing by the adults, and that was uh, Victory in Japan Day, and uh, uh, later that year, and I think in September. And then by on December the 8th, 1945, my father came home late at night uh, in his Navy uniform, <clears throat> discharged uh, out of the Navy out of Jacksonville, Florida. <clears throat> and my mother said, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. So he brought me a little red wagon and a pack of crackers. And I remember playing with his um, ribbons, um, and I thought they were dentine chewing gum because I thought I had, uh, that's the only thing that I had seen that was like that. And uh, so uh, I remember it was a night of rejoicing. We went to uh, my uncle's house, and uh, I was allowed to stay up very, very late with my cousin, and uh, my uncle had been in the Marine Corps, and he had come home. so. <clears throat> it was uh, <clears throat> it was an early rejoicing in my life uh, in December of 1945. Shortly thereafter, uh, my father moved us out of the little apartment uh, on Moreland down to his hometown, Lithonia, Georgia. Main Street, Lithonia, Georgia. Uh, bought a house from my uncle uh, who moved out in the country. Of course, my mother uh, thought that Lithonia was in the country, and it was in the country. It was in the sticks uh, in 1945, 46. Uh, so I grew up on Main Street, Lithonia, Georgia. That was my first real home. And uh, around me, there were a lot of male-only children uh, that I played with for the next uh, 10 years or so all of which were older than I was. So I was the youngest guy. I was the guy selected to chase the balls out into the woods and go find them. And uh, I was the guy that was often called upon to, uh, to play ball and to fight and to wrestle with and to play marbles and to, you know, all that stuff. So uh, that's, that's how I grew up. I went to Lithonia uh, Elementary and High School. Uh, it was all on one campus in those days. Lithonia was so removed from Atlanta and so very far removed from the seat of power, which was the Cab County and Decatur. Lithonia was about two or three miles uh, just inland uh, into Cab County. The rest was Rockdale County. And so uh, we had something called the teacherage. It's which the, where the, the non-married, in those days they would call them old maid school teachers. But they lived in the teacherage, which was on the campus of the grades 1 through 12 school. And my little elementary school was built with uh, brand new uh, with uh, Lithonia granite. And uh, so that's where I went grades 1 through 7. Then I went to the high school, grades 8 through 12. 
And so uh, I had the same principal for 12 years, Mr. W.L. Mr. Colombo. And his uh, daughter is now a librarian at the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Claire Colombo. So uh, the, the, those were the influential uh, years in my life. Uh, I was raised by the Holy Trinity. <laughs> School uh, and uh, church and home. Home, church, school. Ch school, home, church. <laughs> all within bike, bicycle distance, all within walking distance, all within a mile of each other. So <clears throat> Lithonia became my hometown. Uh, I'm very honored that they have a little street named after me now. It's not long, but it's all right. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, so I joined, I, joined I, I, I started going to the Methodist Church there, which was just a block or two. It was really a block from the school campus and several blocks from my home. And so uh, my mother took me there. She was a Methodist about 1946. So I've been going to the Lithonia Methodist Church since 1946. And uh, so I did everything that you can do in Lithonia and in that schoolhouse and in that schoolyard and in the church and in the home. Um, that's where I was raised. It was highly contained and I grew up in the 50s, what the TV program called Happy Days. So it was a time in American life after World War II. We were the successor generation to the, what Tom Brokaw has called the greatest generation. My, my, my father came home from World War II, bought that little house on Main Street with the GI Bill, $2,700, and it took him eight years to pay it off. So uh, it, 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 he, he has always been a lesson for me in frugality. Uh, it was uh, save before, uh, you know, use it up, wear it out, make it last, or do without. <laughs> that was the motto of the Great Generation, the motto of those who grew up in the Great Depression. So <clears throat> um, my father worked hard after World War II and finally landed a job as a traveling salesman selling, selling automobile chemicals and waxes and glazes. He traveled the state of Georgia. Uh, routes that I would later travel when I was running statewide. Mm -hmm. Uh, for Lieutenant Governor, which I lost in 74, Secretary of State in 82, which I eventually won, and the U.S. Senate race in 1996. <clears throat> but my father was one of, the, one of the last of the great traveling salesmen of the post-World War II era. Um, as, as 14, 15 million GIs came home from World War II and were discharged, uh, they had the GI Bill and that was about it they had to find employment. So uh, my father struggled for the late 40s, but then about 1950 uh, became a salesman again. He had been a salesman before World War II uh, and part of Roosevelt's CCCs mm -hmm. in, in 1934, stationed up in Clayton at War Woman Dell uh, State Park, which is, which is now State Park, but... Uh, also, which is my hometown. That's right, <laughs> uh, near uh, Clayton. So. Uh, he, he, he really, that was his university, out in the woods and, uh, and driving a truck or resupplying all the camps uh, for the CCC <laughs> boys, uh, what they called Roosevelt's Tree Army. And uh, he resupplied the, drove the truck to resupply the camps in North Georgia, uh, Western North Carolina and Tennessee. So that was his university for about a year. And he came out of that and got a job uh, with Atlanta Linen, and uh, he drove a linen truck, <clears throat> got up early, was in Covington by 6 a.m., 7 o'clock, whatever, put in a full day, then drove that Atlanta Linen truck back to Atlanta. So he covered a wide swath, and he did that before, before Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the Pearl Harbor attack, and then joined the Navy and uh, served at Pearl Harbor uh, after the attack and uh, was discharged. So he made a life for us, and he saved and scrimped and built a house about five doors down up on a hill, which is where I spent my teenage years, um, the house that my father still lives in now. I have an apartment in Buckhead, but my father lives there, and uh, pretty much by himself, 
although we have day people come in. He's going on 95 now. My mother passed away two and a half years ago. She was a, a, a beautiful lady, brunette, out of uh, northeast Georgia, farms. And uh, she came from a family of tall people. And her, her father, who died in, this, in the 1918 swine flu, ep uh, not swine flu, but uh, Spanish flu epidemic, uh, he was tall. And my, I never knew him. I never knew either of my grandfathers, but I knew my grandmothers, and they helped raise me. Uh, but my, mo my mother worked. She worked while my father was off at World War II, like many women entering the workforce. And she became a darn good secretary. And later she, after the war, after World War II, she became a, a secretary at, um, it used to be called Atlanta Paper Company, now it's, now it's called Mead Packaging. And they did the packaging for the Coca-Cola Company. So uh, she, um, she worked, and my father worked, and my grandmother kept me, kept me there on Moreland Avenue, on my grandmother on my mother's side. And then my grandmother on my daddy's side kept me uh, during the day while, uh, while mother and father worked. So uh, I grew up uh, with lots of love, lots of cousins, lots of uncles and aunts. But on my mother's side, they were tall. And uh, on my father's side, they were stout. In the old country days, they were called stout. <laughs> so uh, I grew up tall and stout. I was the tallest guy in my high school class. And when I went to Vietnam, I was 6'2", 215. So I was tall and stout, and um, but I was very thin in high school. I but I but I but I having played with boys older than I was since I was like third grade on. Uh, I learned the sports uh, taught to me by the local men, young boys in the neighborhood: Edgar Abbott, Bill Chapman, Wheeler Davidson Jr., and all those, um, all older than I was. Henry McDonald, all older than I was. And we played ball in each, in, in, in each other's backyards. Uh, true sandlot ball. Baseball, football, basketball, any kind of ball. Uh, if you had a ball, you could get two or three guys together. So, and you had, if you had a ball and a backyard, you could get two or three guys together. So that's, the, that's where I learned sports. So by the time I made it into high school, um, I played eighth grade basketball. By the time I was in the ninth grade, I was the first guy in my class to letter, get a high school letter. I lettered in the baseball. Uh, first string, third base, and leadoff hitter for four straight years. By the time I was in the tenth grade, uh, I played varsity basketball. Uh, by the time I was uh, a senior, I placed a second in the state in uh, tennis, singles. Mm. Won the tennis championship in singles and doubles. Mm. Um, honorable mention all county uh, in basketball. And, uh, you know, did all those extracurricular activities uh, that you need to do. So I went down to Stetson University thinking I was really something. Not many people went on to college, but my father had saved enough money and he was out traveling and we lived in a good house. I went on down to Stetson University. Um, and in the land, Florida, never thinking about politics at all, um, thinking that I might major in physics, that lasted three days. Uh, I didn't have enough math to get into, into basic physics class. So uh, the fourth day, this is a true story, the fourth day of orientation week at Stetson, uh, they said, uh, well, you got to put down some kind of major. So I put down uh, English. I said, I'm good at English. And so the fifth day, I was put in remedial English. So I had failed the writing sample and the grammar sample at Stetson, in college English. And so I found out I was bilingual. I spoke Southern and a little English. <laughs> so I ended up at five eight o'clock classes. We were on the semester system. Five eight o'clock classes every morning at eight o'clock, remedial English. And I learned how to read, I learned how to write. Uh, it was basic training for this old boy who thought he was some hot stuff, and I found out I wasn't hot stuff on the <laughs> college level. And so I, I worked like the Dickens for several years. Uh, the one polit uh, political thing that really injected itself into my world, 
was the uh, 1960 television debates between Jack Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Black and white television, you only had three channels, ABC, NBC, CBS. And I would steal away at night and uh, watch those debates. I was 18 years of age. Now at 18 in Georgia, not many people realize that today, but in those days, Georgia was only one of two states where you could register and vote uh, for president if you were 18 years of age. Uh, later in the 70s, that became an amendment to the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, and now everyone 18 years of age or greater can vote for president. But in those days, in 1960, only two states, and Georgia was one of them. So you became a, a little bit more aware politically uh, by the time you turned 18. You registered for the draft, hello, <laughs> and you could register to vote, hello. So uh, um, I registered for the draft. My father went with me, Decatur Courthouse. Uh, registered for the draft when I was 18, about 1960. Graduated from high school in 1960. Going down to Stetson. But I, I, I had no interest in politics. I was totally apolitical. The only politics I had been aware of was that, that Herman Talmadge had raised, uh, had put together the state sales tax, three, three cent sales tax, about in the early 50s, um, and funded the school systems around Georgia. Uh, and that uh, Ralph McGill, who was uh, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, was uh, generally disliked. But I, I didn't know why. Now I know it was because he was uh, even handed in terms of race. But in those days, you still had the county unit system, you had the good old boys, the wool hat crowd that, that ran the Georgia legislature. Marvin Griffin was governor, Ernest Vandiver, no, not one. You know, um, and, and in 1956, the schools were almost shut down because uh, Vandiver had, had said, no, not one. Uh, but, but ultimately, the Sibley Commission went around holding hearings and, um, and the schools were kept open. Uh, after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision, uh, which uh, called for, uh, with all deliberate speed, the, uh, the, the integration of the school systems. So uh, my education would have stopped in the ninth grade had the Georgia schools been shut down. But as it was, uh, the schools continue to stay open. I got my basic education there in Lothonia, then I went on down to Stetson, and I had to struggle to, to, to survive. Um, eventually, I became a history major, and one day, late in my junior year, I saw uh, where Bobby Kennedy was shaking hands with some students from Stetson. I looked in the and they go below the photo, and I thought, I saw this in the school newspaper, I thought, uh, how in the world are they going to do that? Bobby Kennedy by then was a legend, so was Jack, the president, because they'd gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis in the fall of 62, and I'd seen those tanks and those artillery pieces from the 101st Airborne and the 82nd Airborne come down Highway 17, which split the campus at Stetson University. This was before the interstates. So I saw them en route to Miami and to, and to Key West, for the potential invasion of Cuba. And I'm not sure people really realize how close we came to actually invading Cuba. But it was Jack Kennedy who, who said, in effect, uh, we'll have a blockade around Cuba and the Russians should stop there and then the Russians blinked and they did stop there. So uh, as it turned out, Kennedy made the right decision, saved South Florida from a nuclear holocaust and, and us going to war with the Soviets. But I had my ROTC uniform on that day that, that he went on TV, October 1962. And I realized for the first time, whoa, I, I, me, old Maxi baby, might really be out there in the thick of it with these other people. I said, oh my God. So, uh, but that was averted. So. But I, so by, by, by the fall of, by, by the spring of 1963, I had uh, become a Kennedy, big uh, Jack Kennedy fan and a big Bobby, somewhat a Bobby Kennedy fan. He was the Attorney General. And it said that these students from Stetson University had gotten to shake hands with Bobby Kennedy because they were on the Washington Semester Program. I said, Washington Semester Program? What's that? I looked at the school catalog. It said, see government in action. <laughs> 
<laughs> go to American University for a semester. So I said, well, maybe. So you had to have the head of the dean, uh, the dean of the school, I was in liberal arts, dean of the school of liberal arts, and the head of the history department approve you. Um, so uh, I was going to class with the dean of the university. So after class I that day, I said, do you think I can uh, possibly go on the Washington semester program? And uh, he said, well, come down to my office. He looked at my grades from where I had entered uh, Stetson <clears throat> and then the sophomore exit exam and he couldn't believe that anybody could have improved that much. So remedial English paid off for me. <laughs> um, so I got to go on the Washington semester program. It became an eye-opening, eye life-changing experience. I had not been interested in politics really up to that point, again, except for the Kennedy-Nixon debates. And I, I kind of fell in love with Jack Kennedy, a guy of, a young guy, a guy of my generation. He was 43, I was 18, he was much closer to my age. Um, and it was a generation, it was time for kind of a generational changeover. We see that generational changeover now with Barack Obama and the massive generational changeover in America and in, and in Georgia politics too. But, <clears throat> but um, then it was relatively slight. Jack Kennedy barely beat Nixon. And um, so I went to Washington September 10th, 1963. And my life has not been the same since. <laughs> um, Hubert Humphrey once said that, uh, that, uh, that the only cure for politics is a bombing fluid. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he ought to know. <laughs> so uh, uh, I haven't had in bombing fluid yet, so I guess I'm not cured yet. But, uh, but I went to the Washington Smith Program at American University, September 10th, 1963. And within a week was hooked. I had attended my first congressional hearing and uh, courtesy of Charles Weltner for the congressman from uh, the fourth district out of, out of Atlanta. And then, then later, of course, uh, it was split due to 1962 Baker versus Carr, one man, one vote. And uh, the fourth congressional district was split in the 1964. Uh, congressman Jim Mackey ran for Congress there. I became his very good boy. I uh, had a big job. I took out the trash. <laughs> so, um, so by 1965, I was, uh, I had a little office in the Library of Congress overlooking the Supreme Court and the U.S. Senate buildings and the Capitol. I mean, I thought I had made a pretty rapid ascent in, uh, in, in, in national and Georgia politics because I had latched on to a winner. Mr. Jim Mackey. He lost in a very narrow election in 1966, and we can get into that. But um, the, by, by the midsummer of 1965, Lyndon Johnson, and you can just hear him now, uh, say, uh, I want the interns down on the South Lawn. And somebody says, yes, sir, we'll, we'll have the congressional interns down. He said, no, no, I want all the interns down on the South Lawn. So he invited all 10,000 interns in Washington, D.C., not just the congressional interns, but all, all the interns and all the bureaucracies and agencies in town, as well as the congressional interns, 10,000 interns. We packed the South Lawn of the White House. We thought we were big stuff. Um, and here comes Johnson out on the South Lawn, President Johnson, but followed and I'm not sure why he did that. Maybe, maybe General Maxwell Taylor was in the office and he said, come on, go with me. We're going to see these young kids out here or something like that. I don't know. But Johnson was followed as he went through the crowd of young people, all 10,000 of us, uh, by four-star General Maxwell Taylor. Now, Maxwell Taylor, had, had a young Brigadier General, had been the first out the door in the Normandy invasion, which we're going to celebrate the 65th anniversary coming up June 6th. Of, 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 of 09. But on that first June 6, 1944, Maxwell Taylor, about 2 a.m. in the morning, was the first out the door with the 101st Airborne jumping at Normandy behind the lines. So Maxwell Taylor had already proven his, his courage and uh, he had become the, the, the uh, Kennedy made him chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the Kennedy family was in, enraptured with Maxwell Taylor. Um, matter of fact, Bobby, one of Bobby Kennedy's sons is named Max, after General Maxwell Taylor. Uh, 
And of course, Max is my name, so, you know. So I never met General Maxwell Taylor until much later. But it seems to me that moment is like frozen in time where Johnson had it all. He had the biggest majority in the Congress, in the Senate, in the House since FDR in 1933. He put the hammer to the, to the pedal to the metal and pushed through so many, so many pieces of legislation, we're still sorting it all out. <laughs> so, uh, but he, had, he was stalked by Vietnam. Maxwell Taylor has suggested a build up in 61, 62 to President Kennedy of, uh, of ground forces there. Um, now, there are those who say that President Kennedy would have handled different Vietnam differently. Um, one of his aides wrote a book after President Kennedy was assassinated and said, you know, that President Kennedy had told him that after the election, after the election of 64, um, then he was going to pull the troops out because MacArthur had warned him that we didn't need to need a, a land war in Asia. Um, Kenny O'Donnell, I think, was his name. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one that was very close to the president, one of the Irish mafia from Boston that Kennedy had with him. Um, so, uh, but November 19, 1963, by virtue of being on the Washington Semester Program, I'm in the White House. No, due to no fault of my own, or new, no, no, no great shakes of my own, but they, the Washington Semester Program had put together a, a, a seminar with Mac George Bundy, the National Security Affairs Advisor in the White House, November 19, 1963. And after the um, talking of, uh, to, to us a little bit, he mentioned that Laos had become a neutral country in 1962. Um, it was a negotiation by the Kennedy, Kennedy administration with Abel Harriman taking the lead. Um, that proved fatal to ultimately the war in South Vietnam because that was the beginning of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, North Vietnam, through Laos, down through Cambodia, into uh, Saigon and various other points along the border. So it provided a sanctuary uh, for the North Vietnamese. The North Vietnamese said later, after the Vietnam War was concluded, that had we successfully cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, there was no way they could have won the war in the South. Now, we tried surreptitiously. The CIA, uh, special ops, covert ops, all kind of black ops, every kind of thing in Laos and Cambodia, um, and some in North Vietnam, but it really didn't work. So, <clears throat> um, but, but I became one of the last people to see the Oval Office under President Kennedy. There was the turquoise uh, rug with the great seal of the United States, the presidential seal. There was the rocking back chair. There was the desk, the famed Kennedy desk that had been uh, brought to the Oval Office by President Kennedy, uh, given to the uh, American President Buchanan by Queen Victoria, uh, made out of wood from a ship, an uh, American ship captured by the British in the War of 1812. So Kennedy had a sense of history. As a matter of fact, the thing he liked most in the White House was a sense of history, and the thing he feared most was human miscalculation, he said. So Kennedy had a sense of history, um, and he had a sense, history, sense of history about Indochina, too, and the French War there. He had been in the Senate when that happened. J happened. Johnson had been in the Senate, too, and he saw the Republicans rise on the backs of the Red Scare, rise on the backs of McCarthyism, and uh, the communist, communists are now around every tree and the fear and, and so forth. So um, when, when Bush did all that kind of stuff in the, in the first decade of this, this century, the 21st century, uh, it was very reminiscent of the way the Republicans rose to power um, in the late 40s and early 50s. Johnson was very painfully aware of that. And so uh, Kennedy is assassinated, November 22nd, 19, 1963. I'm, in, I'm in, in my dorm at American University, and um, about, about one o'clock, I come in my room, headed down to the Capitol to do my research project, and believe it or not, I did it on um, the, how a Senate office is run, the administrative assistant, right-hand man of the senator. So uh, that was my research project. I. <laughs> I looked at my roommate, who was on the floor trying to tune in the radio. He said, the president's been shot. And I said, oh my God. We ran down to the TV room and saw Walter Cronkite say, a little after 1 p.m., the president of the United States 
died. Oh my God. You, anybody that didn't live through that period cannot understand it, but uh, I quickly got a cab, went down to the White House. By that time, I was shocked to see black crepe already on the White House. I've not heard anybody really talk about that, but I got to hand it to the White House staff. They, they, they somehow were right on, right on the money. I, I hate it, but that was the reason. But anyway, I hung around the White House uh, late into the night, and then President uh, Johnson, President Johnson, it was weird to say that, President Johnson flew in on the South Lawn uh, with the black crepe still on the White House, uh, and those eerie yellow lights uh, on the White House flew in and landed, and um, that began the Johnson presidency. Um, Ted Sorensen still wrote some of the speeches, but he was gone. Pretty soon, all the Kennedy people were gone, replaced by the Johnson folks. Um, and so, 1965, Johnson had it all, but he was stalked on that summer day with 10,000 interns out there in the Congress full of, full of Democrats, he was stalked by the Vietnam War. The summer of 1965 also was a turning point for me. About the third week of July, I was asked to come over to Senator Dick Russell's office. I was a congressional intern, uh, and the woods are full of them in the summer. And, uh, but I, and I was from Georgia, and I was an intern with the congressman from Georgia. But I was asked to come to sit at the feet of Senator Russell. It was a two-hour off-the-record chat with Senator Russell. And that's where I met Buddy Darden, who later became a congressman from Georgia and uh, a dear friend. So I came into the Senate Armed Services Committee room, and Russell was there. And so were the young people from, from Georgia interning, mostly in his office. And um, we sat down. It was understood it was off the record, but I made some little notes anyway. And Russell explained that the French had uh, about 10 times better intelligence in terms of Vietnam than we did then. Um, and that he wished that the elections had gone ahead in 1958 and that Ho Chi Minh had been on the ballot in South Vietnam and he would have won 80 percent and that would have been, been it. Um, but he said at the time, the summer of 65, it is the most perplexing thing ever to face the American people. We're there and don't want to be. Uh, we're there and we can't get out. That was Russell's take on it. Privately, he was, he was very leery of the big land build up there. And he tried to talk Jack Johnson out of it uh, late one night. I got that from a former <coughs> Russell staffer. Uh, so, so, and also Fritz Hollings, before he left the U.S. Senate, told me that he was the runner between Russell uh, and Johnson. He would, <laughs> Russell would write out a note about Vietnam and give it to Fritz Hollings, and Fritz Hollings would run down to Johnson in the White House and... Uh, and communicate to Johnson that way. Russell had been the protege of Johnson in the Senate. There's a book out by Robert Cairo, who's the biographer of Lyndon Johnson, and it's called Master of the Senate. But the real master of the Senate was Richard B. Russell, who taught Johnson all of his tricks. Now, Johnson was wise enough to know that Russell was the man. And so the tapes, the Russell Johnson tapes show where um, Johnson is right up in Russell's face and says, I want you to be my daddy. In other words, they were two Southerners, and, and Ru Johnson wanted Russell to look out for him and teach him the ropes in the Senate. Russell um, knew the Senate better than any man alive, like Robert C. Byrd today. Ru Ru Russell was also the mentor of Robert C. Byrd. Uh, Russell was the mentor of, of senators who really wanted to know the Senate. He was the mentor for a generation of leaders. Johnson, Robert C. Byrd, and others. Uh, Teddy Kennedy. As a matter of fact, there is a great story where 
Teddy Kennedy and Robert Byrd are running for majority leader. And Russell is still alive, it's 70, 71, when Russell is dying of emphysema. And um, aides would run to the caucus and say yes, that Russell is still alive because his vote was for Byrd. And, and so ultimately Byrd beat Ted Kennedy for majority leader by one vote and Russell was still alive. And when Russell passed away, Robert C. Byrd came over to Russell's office and quietly went in his office and laid one red rose, one rose on uh, Russell's desk and left. So, so Russell had a powerful influence on the Senate. Um, later, Joe Biden, who's now Vice President of the United States, uh, told me a story. He said, uh, when he first came, he was 30 years old. Uh, you know, you have to be 30 according to the U.S. Constitution. Biden was just a few months shy of that, and his wife and daughter were killed, in a, uh, certainly his wife was killed in an automobile accident, and Biden didn't know whether to, to, to go ahead and take the office or not. Herman Talmadge called him and urged him to take the, take the seat. Biden had been elected. So Biden comes into the Senate, and he goes over to the old man, uh, Stennis. And uh, Stennis, by now, is chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Russell has passed away. Biden uh, is asked by Stennis, says, uh, why did you run for the Senate? And so Biden tells the old Confederate anti-civil rights war horse, well, I ran for it because I believe in civil rights. Wanted, and then he stopped and he stopped himself halfway through, you know. Now, Stennis had, was the inheritor of the massively long conference table that Russell had. It was given to Stennis. Now, the end of that story is that when Stennis was leaving the Senate, he called Biden in. Biden. And he tells Biden, said, son, for many, many years, every Monday or Tuesday, whatever time during the week, the Confederacy met around that table. He didn't say senators from the Confederate States. He said the Confederacy met around that table. What he was saying was that Richard Russell held uh, 35 votes. He needed 34 uh, to tie and 35 to break cloture because in those days you had to have 66, 66 votes uh, to break cloture. A break a filibuster. So that so that the Confederacy, Strom Thurmond, uh, Stennis, Russell, others, could filibuster the civil rights bill. As a matter of fact, the, the man who holds the, the um, record for filibuster time is Strom Thurmond, uh, 24 hours and 18 minutes or something like that. So um, so so Biden tells us tells me the story that Stennis uh, says, son, you know. Every week, the Confederacy met around that table. He said, son, I want you to know you're right and we were wrong. He said, I want you to have this table. So today, it's Joe Biden who has the rights to the old Richard Russell conference table around which he was the master and around which he mustered the senators from the Confederate states and fought uh, against the Civil Rights Bill. He used Johnson in a masterful way, and Johnson put forward the 1958 Civil Rights Bill under Eisenhower, but uh, because he, Russell, knew that he couldn't, he couldn't do it. Anyway, uh, Russell has a tremendous legacy, uh, the author of the school lunch program and others, um, but that, I, 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 I digressed, but, uh, there's so many stories about Richard Russell around the Capitol to this day uh, that you really can't, can't tell them all. But Dick Russell was very kind to me. So Russell tells us interns that he is very leery in effect about the massive land bill built up in 65. It was that week, the third week in July 1965, that Lyndon Johnson made the fateful decision. The McNamara famed fork in the road decision uh, to do the massive land build up. So Johnson goes on TV and um, and says, we're going to send the 1st Air Cavalry Division to Vietnam and all that kind of stuff. The moment he said 1st Air Cavalry Division, I knew where I was going. 
because I wanted to serve with the 1st Air Cavalry Division out of Georgia, out of Fort Benning, the all-helicopter unit, and, uh, and I knew that's where I was going because I was going on active duty 18 October 1965. I was in the pipeline. I was a young second lieutenant. I was going to, going, going to the Army, but now I knew I was going to war, and I knew where that war was going to be. It was going to be Vietnam. Ultimately, uh, that's exactly what I did. The sad part about all that is, by the time I volunteered in the spring of 1967 and left my job, my cushy job as a general's aide here and went to, to war to Vietnam, by that time, McNamara had already commissioned the Pentagon Papers and knew we couldn't win. That's a hell of a thing uh, to know. Uh, while he was sending the rest of us to war. In 1995, when I told, when McNamara's book came out, saying, telling that story, um, Simo, I was in Israel uh, with Shimon Peres, um, and he said, did the McNamara book hurt you? And I said, yes, it did. Uh, matter of fact, I was the quote of the day in the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> You know, if McNamara knew we couldn't win in April 19, 1967, I wish he'd have told me. <laughs> <laughs> but I volunteered, and uh, I wound up in Vietnam uh, early June 1967. By that time, the North Vietnamese had already made a decision that um, they would attack in force with everything they had and throw in everything but the kitchen sink at Tet in 1968. Tet is, this, is the um, Oriental New Year. It's the Chinese New Year. 1 February 19, 1968, the North Vietnamese and the VC opened up with everything they had, hundreds of thousands of troops against the half a million American forces and uh, the Vietnamese forces that were on holiday because it was Tet. So, um, that battle raged, uh, and the American command couldn't believe it. Um, intelligence reports came in for the field and uh, saying this massive number of whatever, and intelligence officers said, no, that can't be true, but it was true. Uh, so a week into the Tet Offensive, the New Newsweek magazine had Westmoreland man on the spot. Um, it was really American strategy that was on the spot. And 5,000 Marines were, ma were, were marooned at Quezon, under siege at Quezon, which is the upper portion of South Vietnam. And the question was, is this going to become an American DNB and food? Is this going to be like 1954 and the French, uh, isolated under siege, where the, uh, uh, the bad guys build tunnels and come through and start picking off uh, portions of the uh, friendlies. Well, um, Johnson told the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I don't want no damn DNB and foo. So heaven and earth was moved by the American military worldwide to rescue those 5,000 Marines at Quezon. The 1st Air Cavalry Division was put in position uh, to be the lead element for that force. And like a fool, I volunteered for that. Uh, I tried to get out of it when I realized that the, that the rescue force was so small. But I didn't figure out that we had B-52s and, and every other kind of aircraft uh, in the American arsenal on our side. <clears throat> so, we held at Quezon Martin Luther King uh, was assassinated April 4, and I was wounded April 8. Actually, the day that the, the First Air Cavalry Division broke the siege. And, but uh, once Martin Luther King was assassinated, that was the news back in America. We were breaking the siege of Quezon, the longest siege of the Vietnam War, but nobody seemed to really care by that point. And a week later, uh, the, the American base was abandoned and uh, plowed under. 
So that began for me a powerful sense of meaninglessness about the Vietnam War. I got wounded April 8, 1968 by a grenade, dropped by a man getting off a helicopter uh, when we were unloading a radio relay team. Uh, I did not know it was his grenade. I certainly didn't know it was live. I reached down to get it thinking it might be my grenade, and the widget fell off my web gear and everything, and boom, within a flash, uh, I lost both legs and my right arm, and lucky to be here to tell the tale. Uh, <clears throat> a year and a half in military and VA hospitals, and I came back to Georgia December 1969. After testifying before Senator Alan Cranston's, freshman Senator Alan Cranston, about the lack of uh, VA health care for the returning Vietnam veterans. If that sounds familiar, uh, we're seeing the same story. Second verse, third verse, fourth verse, over with the Afghan and, and uh, Iraq veterans. Although now, uh, so many of them have been sent back and back and back and back on multiple tours that they're pretty much fried. And uh, what we can do for them, I think, uh, we have to give them love and support but what we can do for them is have to uh, encounter this whole mm, whole hell of post-traumatic stress disorder of which about 750,000 are going to suffer for the rest of their lives and many of them with traumatic brain injury, much less shrapnel in their bodies and lost legs and arms, eyes, portions of their head and so forth. It's awful. So um, <clears throat> how did I just come to run for Georgia politics? I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there in December 1969 in my mother's daddy's house on Main Street in Lithonia, Georgia, really. And, I'm, and, and everybody says I'm a war hero and all that kind of stuff, but there's no job offers. No concrete jobs at all. No firm job offers at all. No job of, offers, period. <laughs> and by the spring of 1970, I realized that I'm not going to get any job offers. I mean, nobody is going to hire a guy with just one hand. And even though I had artificial limbs and I was able to drive my car, <clears throat> which by then I had purchased uh, with a VA grant to use for some of it, uh, I wasn't going to be hired. So I, I thought, well, no girlfriend, no, no apartment, no future, no job, no hope. Now is a great time to run for the state senate. How did, how did I decide on the state senate? I wanted to run for Congress. I wanted to go back to Washington. But by then, DeKalb County had turned massively Republican, and uh, as Georgia is today. And I knew I would lose a race for the Congress. But I took a look at the state senate seat and found that <clears throat> um, it was possible, I thought, to run in a race and have a shot to win because it was a marginal seat. It, um, the incumbent Republican had won just a little bit in the massive Nixon landslide of 68. So um, I decided to announce in April 1970, I was, I was going on 28 years old, uh, for the state Senate. Nobody thought I had a chance to win. Nobody, no other Democrat wanted to run in that Senate seat because they thought they couldn't win. I thought Carl Sanders was going to be the Democratic nominee for governor. He had been a great governor before. He was one of my personal heroes. I didn't know, really, a guy named Jimmy Carter um, until the Carter folks began to approach me in the hot summer of 1970 and said in Reed Ann, Georgia, right up the road into Cab County still, um, Jimmy Carter was going to be speaking at a rally. And so they wanted me to introduce him. Well, I didn't really know Carter. I didn't think he was going to win. Uh, who's going to vote for somebody from Plains, Georgia? <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. Uh, so I agreed to go stand up on my artificial limbs that hot summer night and introduce Jimmy Carter. I met him, and he had a white shirt on, and he had that famous, what it became later known as that famous grin, uh, uh, quiet spoken, and it, but intense, uh, much like Bobby Kennedy, except 
Bobby Kennedy was the most intense man I ever met in my life. Talk about being wound tight, as they say in, in, in Georgia. So uh, Jimmy Carter was wound a little tight, and he was intense, uh, but he was calm and, and soft-spoken. But he had a passion about him. So I didn't think he was going to win. So Jimmy Carter's up on the flatbed truck. There are people out there. It's hot. And uh, I stand up on my limbs. I'm hot. And um, it's in an abandoned service station in Redan, Georgia. I mean, not exactly the, uh, <laughs> the place where you start some big, uh, big uh, part of your life. But that was the first time I met Jimmy Carter. And uh, I said, uh, Jimmy Carter's taking his campaign to the people. Uh, pe people need to be listened to. Uh, we have a government that's not listening, listening to us. And that, uh, and since in my heart, see, I didn't think Jimmy Carter was going to win. I didn't say, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the next governor of Georgia, Jimmy Carter. I didn't say that. <laughs> I'd had enough of foolishness, you know. So, so I said, now, ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> <laughs> and he made one of the worst political speeches I had ever heard. He read from a prepared text, and he was he was really god awful. And I thought to myself, off to the side, I said, "There's no way this guy is going to win a Democratic primary." But son of a gun, Carter gets Sanders in the pri in a, in, a, in a runoff, and Carter wins the Democratic primary runoff and goes on to win the governorship of Georgia. Well, I went on to become the youngest member of the state senate at 28 and the only Vietnam veteran. So. I'm in there now in 1971, and Carter makes a statement in his inaugural address that, I say to you quite frankly, the time for racial discrimination is over. Uh, and that lands him on the cover of Time magazine that week, just to say that. And I think it gives Hamilton, and, uh, Jordan, and Jody Powell the notion then maybe this guy can go places. Um, now, I didn't think that, but I saw him quickly begin to buck heads with the Lieutenant Governor, Lester Maddox. Well, Maddox started convening the Senate, and he deliberately broke, had a gavel that was, you know, kind of pieced together. And when he did the gavel with the television cameras, it, it shattered. And so I'm thinking, oh my God, we got this. Thing. So I became quickly a Carter supporter in a Maddox dominated state Senate. So I was the odd man out. If Carter was for it, Maddox was against it. If Carter was for, was for state reorganization, Maddox was against, Maddox was against it. If Carter was for um, uh, MARTA, Metropolitan Area Rapid Transit Authority, Maddox was against it. If Carter was for regional uh, uh, planning around Atlanta, uh, Maddox was against it. So I voted for all those progressive Carter things. And uh, soon, me and Bobby Rowan and others uh, became a small band of, uh, of insurgents. <laughs> um, and uh, we tried to change the rules of the Senate about, mid, about, about, about uh, 1973. We lost. So Maddox takes away all of our, Maddox, Gene Holly, Hugh Gillis, all those guys, take away all of our privileges for Senate offices on the uh, second, third, fourth. So we get consigned, those all 23 of us, 24 of us, I get consigned to 24 desks down on the first floor with one secretary. That was the penalty for going against, shooting against the king and not killing him. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but what happened was that that's exactly where Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell were plotting for some guy named Jimmy Carter to run for the presidency, which was insane, of course, I thought. But I go down there every day, and I'm pretty much the only one down there, and I mix it up with Hamilton Jordan and Phil Wise, who became the social secretary, and, and Jody Powell, and, and, and I'm thinking, you know, what a laugh it would be for Hamilton Jordan to start negotiating with the Russians. What a <laughs> laugh, you know. And uh, but in nineteen in nineteen seventy four, I ran for lieutenant governor. I said, "This is it. I got to I got to up or out." Like the old army major, I lost to our friend Zell Miller. Actually, I didn't lose to him. I lost to Mary Hitt because Mary Hitt 
and Zell Miller made it to the runoff. I was 1% out of the runoff for lieutenant governor, so I was out. Uh, I cried for about a day or two, and then I pretty much forgot it and moved on. Um, went to work on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee for, for Cranston uh, and Hardkey, and it was there that a young man named Jimmy Carter, having won a bunch of primaries, uh, became president of the United States. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, alive. Summer of 1976, Cranston communicates to me, I think Carter's going to win, and I think you should be head of the VA. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm 34 years of age. I'm here with one pen, one pad, and one desk, and one phone. And you want me to be head of the Veterans Administration. So he, uh, after about three days thought, I said, well, if you think it's a good idea, we'll go for it. So he clears it with Nunn and Talmadge. Nunn, uh, Cranston catches Carter in Seattle behind the curtain and says, there's only two or three things I really want. And one of them is for Max Cleland to be head of the VA. And Carter says, I love Max Cleland. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, Jimmy Carter wins election night, 1976. January uh, of uh, 1977. I'm in my apartment in Washington, D.C., going to work, driving to work every day to the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. And at night in January, I think about, about January 19th or something like that, the day before inauguration, I get this phone call. And it's Hamilton Jordan. And Jordan says, uh, the president would like to see you tomorrow about 5 o'clock. Can you, can you be here? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, well, I want you to, I said, where shall I go? He said, well, I want you to come in through the, that side gate there, well, the south lawn. He said, I think they call it the south lawn. Jordan hadn't, hadn't even been in power long enough to find out that it was the south lawn of the White House and the, and the, and the, and the west gate or something like that. He, he wasn't even, even sure himself. So I show I, I rent this limousine. It's January 20th, 1977. Carter makes his, his, appear, his uh, inaugural address, right? <clears throat> I'm down there, and I hear this Secret Service guy saying, he's going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> and he comes to find out Jimmy Carter is going to walk to the White House. Holy goodness. Well, I make a double time, you know, back to my apartment, change clothes, and I get in a limo that was driven by a former NCO at Walter Reed, and uh, we start trying to make our way to the White House. Well, there's barricade after barricade after barricade. And we, we tell every officer, my name is Max Cleland. They don't know Max Cleland from anything. You know, and I have an appointment with the President of the United States. <laughs> they say, yeah, sure, right, yeah, lots of luck. It took us about an hour just to move through the barricades to, 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 to convince the D.C. police people that, that I really did have an appointment with the President of the United States. <laughs> so about, and so we, we, I came in, uh, camped out in Hamilton Jordan's office. I'll never forget, all the, all the walls were stripped bare. The Ford people had cleaned that place out, and Hamilton Jordan, with a uh, remote, was playing with the television, watching the parade on TV. And so I'm thinking, I oh, don't know, it's hard to believe. It's just hard to believe. So about 5.20 on Inauguration Day, January 20th, 1977, I get ushered in down the hall, and Hamilton Jordan opens the door, and there is Jimmy Carter in the Oval Office, in front of what I consider the Kennedy desk. He had the Kennedy desk put back in there. Johnson had had it removed after Kennedy got, got, got assassinated, and Carter had it moved back in. We talked, he says, submit your plans to being head of the VA, 
how you go to man manage agency to Hamilton. And I had some ideas. I couldn't hardly talk. Talk about the shadow of the presidency or the shadow of the Oval Office. Jimmy Carter was the ultimate good old boy. I mean, I talked to him. I related to him. I mean, he was governor and whatever, but I related to him. But I, I couldn't hardly talk. I, 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 I couldn't hardly say my name. I'm in the Oval Office of the President of the United States, and it's just us. So I was his official first official appointment. And, uh, and on the way out, uh, I said, Mr. President, this is only my second time in the Oval Office. He said, it's only my second time, too. <laughs> so that's how I became head of the Veterans Administration. March 2nd, 1977, I was sworn in as head of the VA. 34 years old, first Vietnam veteran, youngest man ever to head the agency. 172 hospitals, 86 outpatient clinics. In those days, it had a budget of about $20, $22 billion. $22 billion. Now it's about $50 billion or more. Uh, the biggest single presence in America of any other uh, agency other than the Postal Service. So, uh, can we pause there real, real we, we can pause right there. Well, uh, President Carter swore me in as head of the VA. March 2nd, 1977, we had a ceremony in the Oval Office. I brought my mother and daddy and my minister from the Methodist Church in Lithonia. There was Sam Brown. Sam Brown had led the uh, anti-war moratorium March on Washington in 1970. He was dressed up in a suit. Uh, President Carter had appointed him as head of action, uh, the federal agency. So uh, I approached Sam Brown and I said, Sam, I see you dressed up in a suit. He said, I've learned in my years in politics why offend them with style when you can offend them with substance? <laughs> I will never forget that. So the, f but Carter had had before I saw him, uh, while he was still at the Capitol, uh, signed the pardon, presidential pardon for draft evaders. Uh, veterans organizations all called it amnesty. Uh, and that got hung around Carter's neck politically. The VFW, four years later, created a uh, PAC, and they endorsed Ronald Reagan. And uh, Reagan won, not because of the VFW, but Reagan won four years later. So in many ways, although President Carter appointed a Vietnam veteran head of the VA and trusted me to do it, um, we were swimming up upstream from the beginning. Uh, against the veterans organizations and uh, and so <clears throat> I had to not had to but I wanted to go out and do the best I could to shake up the VA without tearing it apart uh, so I, I conducted multiple visits out in the field to VA hospitals multiple visits and um, some surprise visits huge system. The only way you really manage it is through leadership. You, you, you can't even try to manage it, but you try. You try to manage it. Um, and my heart, heart goes out to those trying to handle the VA now with the onslaught of Iraq veterans and Afghan veterans and that war still is, both those wars are still going on. <clears throat> what do you think of those wars? I think that uh, we ought to be out of Iraq tomorrow um, you, 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 but you can't withdraw that many troops that fast. So I'm glad the president has settled upon uh, uh, the, two, the 2011 as the uh, as the date for, for which American combat troops will be withdrawn, and they should be. We should have never gone into Iraq. Although I voted for the Iraq, Iraq War resolution, Cheney was saying there was nuclear weapons there, that there were weapons of mass destruction in the country. Saddam was about to use them. Uh, Condi Rice was talking about a mushroom cloud. Uh, the administration put on a massive campaign uh, after 9-11 to use Iraq as the uh, sine qua non of the battle against terrorism. The president actually said that. It was not. Um, the, the embarrassment of the, of the United States is that eight years later, uh, after 9-11, uh, in 2001, we still haven't killed or captured Osama bin Laden and his terrorist cadre. Uh, 
So now we will, uh, with a new president, we will, and a new administration, we will focus on withdrawing the troops from Iraq, um, going after bin Laden and his terrorist cadre in Afghanistan and, uh, and Pakistan. Uh, the real danger to the United States now is uh, um, a nuclear weapon in the hands of uh, the Islamic uh, militants uh, headed up by bin Laden. And um, the Taliban is really a cover for uh, Al Qaeda. Now we, we, we funded Al Qaeda in Afghanistan when, when they were fighting, fighting the Russians. <clears throat> Uh, matter of fact, we funded every one of our enemies uh, since World War II. We funded uh, Ho Chi Minh, we funded uh, Saddam Hussein, and we funded uh, uh, Bin Laden. Now Bin Laden uh, sees the United States as uh, and Western Europe and Christians and Jews as uh, enemies of Islam. Uh, he is a, an Islamic fanaticist, and uh, his, uh, his cadre uh, is the same. Um, now, I can see some argument for an anti-American point of view, but I can't see uh, going out and killing Americans by the thousands, and I can't see just arbitrarily using suicide bombers in Western Europe, uh, Spain, and around just to just to make a point, just just to provide a big news story where you bunch of killing a bunch of innocent people. Now, the Vietnam VC did that, NBA did that. Um, I've seen that before. I've seen this movie before. You, the, going, going against Bin Laden and his terrorist cadre, you're going to have to really think about how to fight uh, guerrillas. Uh, and in that part of the world, you're, you're dealing with their, their part of the world, not our part of the world. So it's going to be a bitch. It's going to be hard. Uh, and I'm afraid it'll be long. But uh, you say we have no choice. We cannot let stand quite frankly, uh, the assault on 9-11 uh, and bin Laden. Bin Laden must be brought to justice, and it's so much his terrorist cadre. Now, I understand that the grievances out there in the Islamic world, but against Western Europe, against uh, colonial powers and powers against America, America but uh, that's not the way to handle it. So <clears throat> uh, with the combination of President Obama, uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, and one of these days, probably a brand new Secretary of Defense, and a whole new lineup uh, with the military, withdrawing the army, particularly, and the Marine Corps from Iraq, and uh, rethinking a, exactly who is the biggest threat against us, and dealing with that. Uh, you're going to have a long, long war, but you, you're going to have a smarter war. We've got to fight smarter. It can't be Vietnam all over again. can't be Iraq all over again. It uh, can't be no, no strategy to win, no strategy to end. It cannot be that. So. Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real, real nut to crack for the president. The biggest nut to crack, I think, is the economy here. Uh, we're losing hundreds of thousands of jobs each month, and uh, that will continue for another few years. We are going down into a deflationary depression, regardless of what the president or the Congress does. Uh, I think uh, the, I the end of bailouts is soon to arrive. <laughs> because there won't be enough money. <laughs> and some, some banks are going to fail. Some companies are going to fail. Chrysler just declared bankruptcy the other day. I mean, um, it's going to be a bear. Uh, but in three or four months, three or four years, uh, this thing will hit bottom and we'll start another 60-year growth cycle. But it's going to be hell to go through. Uh, that and, and, and the, and the uh, two wars abroad, uh, I'm telling you, people in Washington have their work cut out for them. So, uh, but, I, but I, I think when you commit American forces, the American people have to be with you, uh, and they have to be with you enough to support the wounded when they come home. Let's talk for a minute about our war on terror here. Well, again, you have to be smarter. Um, you can't shut down the United States uh, and what it stands for in the world. You can't, can't obviate the Constitution. You can't do that. Um, what was it Ben Franklin said? You know, you, those who want security over safety deserve neither. What you have to do, and uh, when I was in the Senate, I voted for Homeland, the creation of the Homeland Security Department. 
and I, I was on the 9-11 Commission, and the best recommendation to come out of there is the uh, um, intelligence czar, or the, the single point at which all the intelligence comes together. That was really the focus uh, after World War II, after the attack at Pearl Harbor in 1947 for the Defense Reorganization Act, uh, where Harry Truman uh, uh, and the Democratic Congress created uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the, Sec the Air Force the Department, and the CIA. The CIA was supposed to be the, the, uh, the, 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 the ultimate gatherer of all the intelligence, but 80% of the intelligence budget is in the, the Pentagon, so you got a tail wagging the dog here. So it's uh, you have a battle among the intelligence community, which is about 15 and 16 intelligence agencies. Uh, but you do need uh, some person at the top that is analyzing the, the strategy. My understanding is that uh, it's a four-star admiral now, Rhodes Scholar, um, who I know personally, and um, I think he's perfect for the job and the president would be well served to, to listen to him. Uh, so I think we got our intelligence house more in order now. Um, we're getting out of Iraq now, uh, and uh, we're focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan now. And now I think we, ha we realize we have to be a hell of a lot smarter, uh, not just harder. Uh, I think we, we realize we have to coordinate with uh, other agencies, other intelligence agencies, particularly Western European intelligence agencies. We did not really do that. And the FBI and the CIA really weren't talking to each other before 9-11. Whether they're talking to each other now or not, I'm not sure. But uh, you do have Homeland Security that is forcing people to talk together that didn't before talk to, uh, that before didn't talk to each other in Washington. So. Um, you're, you're, you're driving the mammoth bureaucracies uh, together to make better sense of all of this picture out there um, for the president, whoever the president is. So I think Obama is going to be a, lot, a hell of a lot better served uh, than former presidents. Uh, this was tried, uh, President Kennedy tried to, after the Bay of Pigs, to put the CIA back in its original role as an intelligence gatherer rather than uh, as a political operative abroad, but he was killed before he could really uh, run that through. So maybe now we can get that act together. Uh, I certainly hope so. It's not just an intelligence, see 9-11 was not just an intelligence failure, it was also an intelligence uh, blind spot because uh, the Bush administration was all focused on Iraq. They were not focused on uh, and some missile defense shield or something over the Pacific. Um, rather than uh, the growth of terrorism, the growth of Al Qaeda, which had uh, declared war on us in 1998. We're often criticized for mistreating terrorists who we have <coughs> captured. Uh, what, is, what do you think about that? It's my view that um, uh, you, you, just because they're terrorists and guerrillas, you still have to treat them as POWs. That's my view. Now, that's basically what, what has come about after uh, the American people have been embarrassed and the American government has been embarrassed by the excesses of uh, particularly uh, the Bush administration and uh, Cheney, where the, he got the uh, Attorney General's office to write uh, memos legitimizing uh, CIA waterboarding and so forth, and hid tapes uh, of waterboarding, CIA tapes of waterboarding uh, from uh, the judicial uh, branch. And uh, that's uh, obstruction of justice. So, you know, um, we, we're in we're in tough shape now. You got a you got a lot to straighten out. But the, but the, the step number one, you got to treat uh, prisoners of war as prisoners of war. I don't care whether they're terrorists or guerrillas or wearing a uniform. You treat them as prisoners of war. You treat treat them as uh, as captured POWs. And that's, what, that's basically what McCain is saying, and I agree with him. Let's get back to politics. You decide to run for Secretary of State. Right. Why not Lieutenant Governor or Governor? I didn't want to tackle Zell Miller again, and Zell Miller uh, did not want me to run against him in uh, 81 or 82. Uh, we became good friends by then. 
Um, we were always good friends. We became good friends. I, I, I didn't, uh, the, the, the Secretary of State's office was in effect open because Mr. Ben, <coughs> Mr. Ben Fortson had passed away. David Porthos had been appointed to that slot by Governor Busby. Uh, Zell Miller decided to run for Lieutenant Governor again. Uh, and so I didn't want to tackle Zell Miller. And uh, I thought that the Secretary of State's office would be a much more uh, suitable office for me. It was full time, it had a good staff, had a good mission, and uh, I liked the way Mr. Ben operated. He was always kind to me, he had his door open all the time. That's the way I wanted to operate. <clears throat> and uh, so I ran uh, for Secretary of State because I felt that the uh, head, being head of the VA under President Carter for four years gave me a leg up in terms of name ID and recognition, and it did. And uh, versus a man who, had, who was a wonderful guy, David Poitras, and he's running for governor now and got a great shot, but uh, in those days, relatively unknown, had been appointed to that position and had not run statewide. I had run statewide in 74, uh, knew, where, knew where the stumps were, <laughs> and, and uh, had made my share of mistakes and was ready to run and win in, in 82. That's what happened. Tell us about the Office of Secretary of State. It seems to <clears> me <throat> that, that uh, some Georgians don't know really what the Secretary of State does. Well, they will soon find out. Uh, the Secretary of State's office is the Chief Elections Officer of Georgia. I mentioned Mr. Mackey. Mr. Mackey lost in 1966 when a judge ruled that 1,200 overvotes on a new IBM Votomatic card uh, were, were thrown out. That would have given Mackey the election. They were overvotes. They voted, people voted for Mackey, and then they voted for the de straight Democratic Party ticket. There is no such thing as a straight party ticket in Georgia anymore. But um, that was the first computer era that cost an election in Georgia. You move that forward, then you got in 2000, you got the hanging chads in Florida and so forth. So uh, Governor Barnes and uh, Secretary of State. Um, um, Massey. Uh, no, 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 not Massey, but uh, uh, the president of Young Harris now. Uh, Kathy Cox. Kathy Cox. Secretary of State Kathy decided Georgia would be the first state in America to go all computerized voting. Sounded like a great idea. Uh, but the contract went to Diebold. Diebold had a um, president that was in Ohio, and he had, uh, he was represented by a congressman that was on the, when the Republicans controlled Congress, was on the House uh, committee that, uh, out of which came the Help America Vote Act in 2001-2002. Uh, and so this guy argued against the paper ballot and made sure, uh, or, or any, any, argued against the paper trail for black box voting, in effect. And uh, that's what Diebold wanted. Um, it was uh, the, the head of Diebold who, uh, who, who uh, well, it was someone from Diebold who in 2002 came in 24 hours before uh, the election was held, after the Secretary of State had cleared all uh, election uh, machines and put in fixes in Fulton and DeKalb counties uh, to uh, uh, supposedly uh, fix the clock. The clock never got fixed, but uh, a parallel program was installed. No, that parallel program is now in the, in the, in the breast of the uh, U.S. Attorney General's office. Whether or not that program shifted votes on that black box voting, nobody knows. Why? Because Diebold technicians ran the election that year, not Secretary of State election officials. Why? Because the, 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 the equipment was so brand new that no election official had ever really done that before. Not really. So um, it wasn't the Secretary of State's office that really ran the elections. It was Diebold that ran the elections. And now we know, because in 2004 it was the head of Diebold that guaranteed Ohio for Bush in a letter, in a fundraising letter. So uh, 
Um, you don't know what happened. I don't know what happened in 2002 in Fulton and DeKalb, not really. And we're not quite sure what happened in Ohio uh, in 2004. So black box voting now has gotten a terrible, bad, terribly bad reputation and should be followed with a paper trail. So that a third party, chief elections officers like the Secretary of State and all the election officials in Georgia should be able to verify um, a ballot. And, and, and poll watchers should be able to verify a ballot without the hanging chad, without uh, the secrecy of the black box just conducting a vote and some private uh, proprietary organization running elections. So now we've learned a hell of a lot about elections. We know now that the Secretary of State's office in Georgia is in charge of all elections in the state. It is also in charge of all the corporations, uh, registering card corporations, and certainly in charge of investments. Not what you invest, but uh, keeping elections, keeping investments public so that, <clears throat> or, or, or the offerings uh, are public, so that the, the consumer uh, can be aware of what's going on. So the Secretary of State's office is a very meaningful office in Georgia. It's a great office. Uh, doesn't necessarily get caught up in a whole heck of a lot of politics, uh, but can get caught up in politics if you want to. But everybody in Georgia has an interest in the clean elections process. And uh, God knows I certainly do. And uh, we have a vested interest then in uh, who gets elected Secretary of State. You were elected uh, three more times. Yeah. And served in that office for, what, 14 years? Uh, 12, yeah. 12 years. And then you decided to resign and run for the United States Senate. Right. It was, I thought that I would be, when, when, when Zell Miller told me he was going to run for the second time for, for re-election, after saying that he was not, I said, fine, uh, go for it. So I thought that um, I would spend pretty much the rest of my life as Secretary of State in Georgia. I thought that was it. I said, you know, God, if you expect to, 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 to me to run for anything else, you got to open the door. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I tried to open the door. I, th I thought about running for governor, but that, that didn't work out. Uh, Zell Miller ran for re-election, so that was, that was out. <clears throat> so I was Secretary of State, and uh, all of a sudden, 1994, Five, four, four or five, late, late 94, Sam Nunn decides to walk. Sam Nunn decides to retire from the United States Senate. My goodness alive, he shook up the apple cart in Georgia. Um, I was there on the floor of the, of the state Senate when Sam Nunn made his farewell statement and, and uh, announced that he was not going to run for election. Well, one week later, I'm in. And January 1995, I resigned as Secretary of State and ran like the Dickens for basically two years for, uh, uh, for U.S. Senate. My potential opponent in the uh, Democratic primary was Buddy Darden, who I had met in Dick Russell's office in the summer of 65. Mm -hmm. Buddy had already lost uh, the, the, uh, the seat in the Congress by then, and I was better known than, than Buddy. And, and I thought I was in better position. So Buddy stayed out of it. In many ways, uh, he cleared the way for me to run and win. I ran against a guy named Guy Milner, a self-funder, as they say in American politics today. He spent $13.5 million, I spent three, And uh, I won by 30,000 votes in 96. Clinton being on the ballot helped. There's no question about that. Because by that time, <clears throat> uh, there was a big gender gap. The females in Georgia were voting for Clinton and for me. Um, so I won in 96 and thought that, and, and took the Richard B. Russell, Sam Nunn Senate seat that had uh, been hallowed all of my life by those two men. I knew them, I had been uh, in their offices, and I had been in the Office of uh, these of the uh, I mean the Armed Services Committee room, and I had said to myself that there's only one way I'll go back to Washington, and that is to take Sam Nunn's seat on the Armed Services Committee. Well, and so I said, well, I know that's not going to happen because Sam Nunn's going to stay there forever. Well, he didn't. So uh, 
I ran. I ran in 95 and 96 and uh, was lucky to win, really, looking back on it. Um, and we really didn't know whether we had won till the next day, about a little after 9.30 a.m. Uh, the next day when uh, Miller, uh, Guy Milder conceded. Um, and I couldn't believe it. I was the junior senator from Georgia. Uh, Coverdale was the senior was a senior senator. Good man. Coverdale and I had Coverdale and I had come to the state senate at the same year, 1970. He sat right in front of me. I sat right behind him. We actually worked together back in those days. Uh, moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats actually worked together in the state senate. Um, so Coverdale and I had a wonderful uh, friendship relationship. Uh, he was Republican and I was Democrat, but. We, we really had a good personal relationship and a good political professional relationship going. Um, and then Coverdell had that brain hemorrhage and died. And before I could say, my goodness, um, I was the senior senator from Georgia. Oh my God. So I, I had all, I had kind of, I had Dick Russell's office, I had his phone number. Somebody got out of the archives, Dick Russell's desk. I mean, I put up my picture of me and Dick Russell when I was an intern, you know. Uh, I had, I, it was a picture where I had, I had the classic deer in the headlights look, you know, like <laughs> kind of thing. Because <laughs> I was just 21, you know, and uh, he was the old pro. And uh, so I saw myself as, as a successor to Dick Russell and Sam Nunn sitting on the Armed Services Committee and rising in rank and stature for America's national security, our veterans, our armed services, and uh, I began to travel around the world and see our services. Uh, then George Bush uh, got elected. The whole world changed. For me, I was up in 2002, and uh, they came after me big time, and especially after 9-11. Uh, they converted the whole country, and certainly the Congress, uh, for a while, uh, much like a Swami, you know, mesmerizes uh, that cobra, you know, they just, uh, you know, they just uh, mesmerize the country with uh, national security and all that kind of stuff. Well, I had been an early sponsor of Homeland Security legislation with, with um, uh, the senator from Connecticut, uh, not, not Dodd, but uh, Middle Block. <laughs> Anyway, he became vice president, vice presidential uh, candidate with uh, Gore. Yeah, I have a mental block too, but I know his <laughs> wife very well. Yeah, well. <laughs> anyway, uh, we had co-sponsored the uh, Homeland Security legislation together. When the White House had opposed it, then the White House flipped, and uh, they said, "Oh yeah, we're going to take it over as an issue." So. Um, and Bill Frist, before just so so Bush ran with the war in Iraq and invading Iraq, and uh, Frist, the minority majority leader, said Homeland Security is going to be our issue. So they came after me big time. Um, Karl Rove came down, recruited Saxby Shamless. Well, an unknown story about that is that uh, Roy Barnes, in his reapportionment plan, had uh, Governor Roy Barnes had uh, created a, a, a district for, for Shamless. Shamless would have run for, this, for the U.S. House again because he was rising in stature and power there. Uh, but Tom Murphy did not. He wanted to create some other uh, set of congressional districts. So he froze out a Saxby Shamless, just like he froze out Newt Gingrich. So it was Tom Murphy in many ways who created Newt Gingrich and, and Tom Murphy in many ways who helped create Saxby Shamless. Because Shamless would have never run for the U.S. Senate against me had he not been frozen out in a reapportionment plan that, 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 that Roy Barnes couldn't get over Tom Murphy, the Speaker of the House. So they passed the reapportionment, the legislature passed the reapportionment plan. Shamless is recruited by, uh, by uh, uh, Karl Rove and uh, they're on the way. So Bush comes down against me five different times. Um, Ralph Reed is now the chairman of the Republican Party in Georgia. So you got Bush, Cheney, 
Rumsfeld, uh, Karl Rove, and Ralph Reed all lined up against me. And uh, they put together an ad morphing my view, uh, morphing my face into the face of uh, uh, bin Laden and, uh, and Saddam Hussein and then me, you know, and uh, insinuating that I was voting against Homeland Security. I did vote against a bunch of amendments by, the Bush, by, by George Bush that would have killed the Homeland Security bill <coughs> in the Senate, but um, they made it look like I was somehow uh, completely out of step with what the, Mar what the people of Georgia wanted. At any rate, um, Ralph Reed mustered, uh, and then the, the flaggers, the people who were, were pissed off with Roy Barnes uh, and pissed off with the Democrats because, of the, because Barnes and the legislature changed the flag. Uh, Ralph Reed did, did a poll and found that for, for white males, this issue came off the charts. So they went after registering white males, only white males, not white females, but white males particularly in South Georgia. And the weekend before the election, Reed put together uh, 300 buses and marched out 10,000 volunteers. And the president came to Savannah and they hit, they fanned out throughout South Georgia and flipped 40 counties in South Georgia alone from Democrat to Republican. Bush, uh, Barnes lost, I lost, Speaker of the House lost, many members of the, of the House and Senate lost because they voted for the flag. flag. And that was the end of democratic domination of Georgia politics for more than a century. Now Georgia politics is dominated by Republicans. Republican governor, Republican lieutenant governor, Republican speaker of the house, Republican committee chairman, and each, each body. Um, and so, and basically uh, you have a Republican state now. Why is that? I think, I think Georgia was going Republican uh, more and more people were voting in the Republican primary. Um, and I think more and more Republicans moved here from the Northeast and the Midwest. They moved to the, it fleshed out the Republican donut around Atlanta. So that's where you see the massive Republican gains. Uh, counties like Cherokee and, and uh, Forsyth and uh, down south of Atlanta in Fayette County. Um, the percentage of Republican uh, votes on election day uh, continue to go up and the percentage of uh, d Democratic votes uh, on election day continue, continue to go down. If you really want to see it, you can see the last presidential election in 2008 where Democrats got 47 percent, Obama got 47 percent, McCain got 53. That was the high water mark of black turnout, which was about 30 uh, percent of the total vote. That was the high water mark of Democratic performance in the state of Georgia. About 80% of the white people vote uh, Republican, and well over 90% of the black people vote Democrat. So you're split now along racial lines in, in Georgia. And as long as you're split along racial lines in Georgia, Democrats lose statewide. So uh, the, the question is now, um, uh, with, with the tremendous turmoil and loss of jobs in Georgia, um, what happens in 2010? Maybe the, American, maybe the people of Georgia want to go back to, to uh, the party that brought them the prosperity in the first place. So, I mean, the issue is no longer the flag. Um, it, it's, it's, it's my job and my family. That's what the issue is. And so the candidate that best appeals to that I think has a great chance of being governor and, and, and down, down the line, except this, this state still leans Republican. It's not a 50-50 state. It's a 47-53 state in favor of the Republicans. So you've got to have a lot of Republicans either stay home or switch by several hundred thousand uh, to the Democratic candidate if a Democratic candidate statewide is going to win. You're a good friend of President Clinton. Right. Tell us about your relationship. Oh, President Clinton is, uh, is the best single politician I've ever met in my whole entire life. And it's not fakey with him. He has in his DNA, in his makeup, um, a heart, a, a feeling for people. He matches that with uh, his incredible mind, which in a Rhodes Scholar mind, 
which in, in, in someone else would come off as uh, cheeky or brash or um, smart alecky. But you match a heart as big as gold, big as, big as the West. You match a tremendous mind and you put that into a southern drawl from Arkansas and you got Bill Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, now, he loves women, likes women, and that's just the way life is. <laughs> now, that ain't gonna change. Um, I will say that uh, Monica went after Bill as well as Bill going after Monica. Uh, that's the best I know of it. Um, she was determined uh, to earn her presidential knee pads, and she got them. <laughs> now, uh, that's, the way, that's the way that turned out. Now, what happened was, by 1998, uh, 99, uh, that was the talk of the world. You couldn't discuss any other subject. No other subject. No, no news person in the world wanted to talk about anything else except Monica and Bill, <clears throat> which gave the Democratic Party as a whole, um, left, left us vulnerable to the charge of being immoral. So you had the rise of the moral voter on the Republican right uh, when they had just lost the presidential election. And it enabled Newt Gingrich and others to play holy, holier than thou, except that they all, that m many of them, especially Newt, had, had, had feet of clay and had to resign from office themselves because of such philandering. So um, it left the voters in 2000 with a choice between Bush, who, was, who, who people thought was, was, was the son of George Herbert Walker Bush um, and to bring a new tone to Washington. Oh, he brought a new tone to Washington, all right. He brought Karl Rove with him. Um, but the, 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 somebody that they didn't particularly know um, versus the Democrats, which looked in more and more immoral on the issues and immoral in action and, and so forth. So Bush wins in 2000. Uh, based on the rise of the of the moral voter, the rise of the moral right wing, the rise of the uh, morality radio um, and right wing radio, and the creation of Fox News uh, in the early 2000s. So um, uh, they had it all going for them, except that the bottom fell out of the economy after the Democrats lost power. And, and the Republicans took it in the year in 2008 because of what? The rise of the economic voter. <laughs> the, the history is repeating itself in so many ways. You had the rise of the prohibition voter in the 20s when things were going really well. And prohibition, whether you were wet or dry, whether you for, for whiskey or against whiskey, that was the big issue in the 1920s. Then you had the stock market crash in, 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 in 29, October 29, and by 1932, no, nobody could think about whiskey or whatever. They're all thinking about, buddy, can, I spare, can you spare a dime? And we had a nationwide unemployment rate of 25%. So if the R gets elected and wipes, and wipes out uh, the prohibition, the Volstead Act, and, uh, uh, and, and repeal, or the Congress repeals that, and, um, and uh, we have beer and whiskey that's legal, and we start taxing it. So now uh, we have the economic voter. When you're losing jobs by the hundreds of thousands each month, now the economic voter is going to get more and more angry. That's what Barack Obama and the Democratic Congress have to watch out for. Because this anger is going to increase. Uh, and anger against taxes, against anything that takes away consumer purchasing power, <clears throat> by the, uh, anger at the banks at the bailouts, uh, just rise in anger. Uh, now, the right wing can feed off of that. Um, whether it's successful in four, three, four years, I don't know. But uh, it, it's a very, it's gonna be pretty ugly out there in two or three, four years. Uh, much more ugly than it is today. But, but right now, your right wing is uh, struggling for leadership in the Republican Party.
they are they are very scattered and very splintered right now. But that doesn't mean they don't have a chance to come back. They'll come back in an anti-tax, <clears throat> um, anti-Washington, anti-bigness uh, kind of way. What else, Max? You're a great man, a great public servant. Is there anything you would like to tell future Georgians? <laughs> Um, I th I think um, to echo the sentiment of, uh, of a man I ran across today that had uh, at lunch. Uh, politics used to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> now it's gotten to be war. Uh, I laid that at the feet of Karl Rove and George Bush and Dick Cheney. Uh, they created war, they created political war in this country. They're paying for it now. We're going to withdraw from Iraq. We'll pursue the real bandits in Afghanistan and, uh, and Pakistan uh, as they cross the borders there. How we heal our land, I think Obama's trying to do that. I think some members of the Democratic Congress and the House and Senate are trying to do that. <clears throat> Uh, but ultimately, uh, the campaigns themselves uh, have to be more than just a money chase and who can put together the most brutal uh, negative ads against someone else. Only the public can do that. The public, the Georgia public, in this case, will have to vote against those people in mass, uh, vote against them in mass, who use uh, surreptitious ads and uh, campaign tax tactics that are not straightforward. There was an effort under McCain Fine Gold, which I co-sponsored when I was in the Senate, to kind of clean up American politics, clean up some money, clean up some ads and so forth. But now the soft money, um, known as 527s, arguing some particular case can come into any any campaign, any federal campaign in America um, and uh, undercut it and there's nobody in charge, nobody to blame. Uh, so maybe the internet, maybe iPods, maybe Twitter, maybe whatever, I don't know, there's, there's 50,000 different ways to communicate to the American public now other than just television. Uh, but the American people are going to have to take responsibility ultimately for the quality of politics that we have. They can blame those in office, they can blame the government, they can blame whoever they want to. But ultimately, as Benjamin Franklin said, you know, it's our system. I mean, a lady came to Franklin after the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and uh, said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government do we have? He said, and lady, you, you have a republic if you can keep it. So it's up to each generation to keep it. It's, uh, it's up to each generation, I think, to make America just a little bit better. I think it's up to each, each generation to make Georgia a little bit better. Otherwise, why run? Why put up with this foolishness? Why, why go through all this stuff? I, I really do believe there, there was a time Probably is back before, you don't have to go too far back in the Senate, Sam Nunn's day, um, when there was a certain camaraderie in the Senate. Now it's war. I can tell you it's war. It's kill or be killed. And uh, what is it? Napoleon said morality lies on the side of the heaviest guns, heaviest artillery. <laughs> She's got the votes in the Senate now. Who's got the votes in the Senate? Well, right now, the Democrats, it looks like they got the votes, 60 votes to stave off cloture and so forth, which more and more makes Republican the senators irrelevant. I don't think the Republican Party, as a hardcore Democrat as I am, ought to become irrelevant in the Senate or anywhere else. I think there's plenty of room for, for argument. Uh, Democrats don't, don't have all the wisdom. But uh, I can tell you, it is war in Washington. and. Um, and Karl Rove and George Bush, George Bush let that happen and Karl Rove made it happen. Uh, they, they went out to kill anybody that disagreed with them, anybody. And um, I know that personally. So uh, it breeds kill or be killed. 
Um, but maybe maybe there's a little bit higher standard in Washington now. Uh, whether there's a higher standard in, in, in the state capitol or not, I'm not sure. Um, what I hear about the Republican takeover of the, of the governorship and the House and the Senate uh, does not please me at all. I mean, I don't, I don't see a bunch of good government types running around down there. So the American people, uh, people of Georgia certainly, uh, they got a chance to speak their mind in 2010. Uh, and um, and uh, what we have to do, those of us who care about the election process, have to make sure it's a fair uh, 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 election and one where all, every ballot is counted. Where I, I, I kind of trust the people more than I do any other entity because if you count the ballots fairly and, uh, and throw it out there and count all the ballots fairly and, and tally them right, the American people are going to be right more, more times than they're not. So we are in the business of self-government. Uh, we have a republic if we can keep it. And uh, for those of us who have fought for it, um, that means a whole hell of a lot to us. If you look back over your career, is there anything you might have done differently? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, start with the Senate. Um, I would have not have voted for the Iraq War Resolution. That was a mistake. I screwed up. I should have known better. <clears throat> but I went through 9-11. Bush uh, pushed it. Brought it right down to the election. Uh, the vote itself came after me big time. Uh, I had grave doubts about the war, Iraq War resolution. I knew that the, the administration would just check it off, just like Johnson wanted to check it off uh, so he could do what he wanted to do. And Bush did what he wanted to do in Iraq, just like Johnson did what he wanted to do in, in Vietnam. I still don't think it really matters, certainly in terms of Vietnam at all. And uh, I'm not sure Iraq has uh, been so, so permanently changed uh, by our presence there or not. We're in Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan due to the attack against us, 9-11, in which we have to bring some justice to that situation. But otherwise, um, you know, we keep our guard up uh, but our hand out. I mean, uh, uh, that's, our, that's our posture. It's not a bad posture. It's a moral posture. It's a good posture. It helps, helps the world. Um, and here in Georgia, you know, what's it all about? Is it all about power? Is it all about office holding? Is it uh, all about campaign contributions? Is it, is it all about a judgeship? Is it all about uh, having your way for a little while? I don't think so. I think it's all about politics. In Georgia and in this country, it's all about uh, making a difference so that you can sleep uh, a little bit better at night. I mean, that's the reason why I participated in it. What has been your proudest moment in politics? Probably when I was uh, sworn in uh, as head of the VA under President Carter. There, I was, I was young, I was 34, I, I had my mother and father there, my Methodist minister there. Um, I was in the Oval Office. It was a president, the first president from Georgia. And uh, I'm kind of surprised I didn't pee in my pants, really. I'm, <laughs> I'm probably so excited. Uh, I will never forget that feeling. Um, I still look at my VA days as my finest days of public service where I did the most good probably in the shortest period of time but I did the where I did the most good made the made the best contribution your biggest disappointment that I voted for the Iraq war resolution because I grieve for those kids that have been killed and for those kids that have been blown to hell that I see at Walter Reed and I grieve for the ones coming back from Afghanistan and Pakistan too but but there's at least there at least there in Afghanistan and Pakistan going after the bad guys. I mean the really bad guys. Iraq after 9/11 didn't make any sense. Uh, and I have to wonder, Bob. Uh, you've been around politics for a long time. 
you have to wonder if you weren't just covering your own rear end uh, by doing that. <clears throat> If you if you weren't if you weren't if you hadn't turned into what you said you were never going to turn into, and that is just somebody trying to hold their own seat, uh, you see to the extent to which that the people will go. I'm all inspector is kind of a case in point with you know the old Everett Dirksen line that when you feel the heat you see the light. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bush put a lot of heat on us uh, and on me all of us up in 2002 to vote for the Iraq War Resolution because uh, if we didn't, but then we were being going to be unpatriotic. I voted for the Iraq Resolution, co-sponsored the Homeland Security Bill, and I was still accused of being unpatriotic and, uh, and having my picture morphed with bin Laden and, and uh, Saddam Hussein. So uh, yeah, that's my biggest single disappointment because uh, I by that move, uh, I participated in sending young men into war uh, for no clear reason. And that is the one issue uh, that I uh, have to uh, disagree with Johnson on. Uh, no clear strategy to win, no clear, no clear rationale uh, in the Vietnam War except kill the bad guys uh, with no understanding of the history behind it. And ultimately, no strategy to get out, except ultimately to lose your rear end and get kicked out. Now, you, that, that, that can't happen. So, uh, as a Vietnam veteran, I, uh, I uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, I have regretted the Iraq War Resolution vote more times than you can possibly imagine. And uh, yet I cannot Try to, I can't dwell on Vietnam and on the Iraq War resolution. I, I gotta, I have to move on with my own life and do what I can to uh, to help others, especially those who are who are suffering. I, I can identify with them. How would you like to be remembered? I, I used to, as Secretary of State. I used to go to those uh, do those tours uh, in the Capitol Rotunda, and I would see those busts of people that were famous in Georgia history. And I said, you know, I would say jokingly that, uh, you know, they, they, they won't have to dismember me. All they got to do is just pour some bronze over me and I'll be, you know, there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I used to joke about that. I think every politician wants to be remembered in, in a positive way. Uh, I don't know, I used to think about that a lot. I don't think about it much anymore. Uh, I think more about now, just living, living, trying to live well today, and trying to make sure that my daddy is as good, well off today as he possibly can be. He's going on 95. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I think the impact you make on other people is primarily in their own eyes, and maybe that's okay. I mean. Churchill said, you know, it's, it's history will be very kind to me because I intend to write it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, uh, I'll do my share of writing, writing my own history, but uh, I don't know. I may, maybe as somebody who just, uh, uh, I used to think about the Vietnam War that uh, the only, only thing that I could do, that I could say about myself is I, I kept faith with my country when it was most difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm no hero. I'm not, not full of courage and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I came back and I, I tried to do my best, <laughs> given my uh, circumstances, to uh, try to turn the country around and try to make a little bit of difference for people who had been screwed up in war and who. Uh, I've become disabled in some way or experienced trauma. I don't know, I find myself on that side of the ledger uh, more and more that uh, just somebody who survived and who tried to make things a little bit better for, for those others who had survived. Well, to many of us, you are a hero. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. And we appreciate all you've done for your state 
and the country. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you on behalf of Young Harris College and yeah. the Russell Library yeah. uh, at the university for being our guest today. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be associated with uh, Young Harris and with uh, the Richard B. Russell Library. The more I think about the life of Richard B. Russell, the more I, uh, I admire it. And uh, the fact that I was glad to serve in his Senate seat for six years is uh, one of the highlights of my life. Thank you.